Good morning, everyone. So we're, we're back in Revelation 4. And I just wanted to finish off because I missed a few verses last, last time. While you're finding it, the, the alpha went well last week. We had two people on. We had Amanda, and if you remember Jen, who got baptised, her partner came on, uh, Chris, and we've had more people invited for to, tonight as well. Um, at least three more people have been invited, so potentially we could have five tonight. But um, yeah, So God is working through Alpha. Um, last week we discussed, is there more to life? And this week it's uh, one of the best sessions, actually, because it's who is Jesus. And uh, you, well, you can't get better than that, really, when we're, we're talking about who, who Jesus is. Uh, he, he tops every subject. Um, so, yeah, and... Um, Yes, the Alpha's going well. Since uh, Wilberforce, I found myself actually being more intentional as well, um, as Kevin said. Does anyone else have anything to share? And, and I, I found myself sort of looking for more opportunities. And uh, this week I had a, a meeting with an assessor at college. Um, and before the meeting, I knew there wouldn't be anyone else involved. It would just be the two of us. So um, I, I just prayed. I asked me how my holiday was, my week off work. And she did. So um, I said, well, I, I went to on a course run by Christian Concern, uh, looking at um, ethics and culture from a biblical perspective, from a Christian viewpoint. Um, and she quickly changed the subject, but she had that opportunity. She could have followed up with more. That door was open for her to ask more if she wanted to, and she didn't take that opportunity, but that's up to her. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like I'm trying to uh, be more intentional and trying to be more vocal and more active now, which is um, which is good. Um, so last week we were continuing in chapter four of Revelation, and we were looking um, about the throne of God and the majesty of God and and the, uh, the the authority and the power that God has, and we were imagining what it would be like to stand before the throne of God. So after we're raptured. I believe the Bible is telling us that immediately after rapture we'll stand before the throne of God and we'll give account for how, how we've lived and we'll, we'll be rewarded, but just imagine what it will be like to, to stand before God. And we had that, that beautiful song, I can only imagine, um, when I'm surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence to my knees? Will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? We don't know. We can only imagine. But it's going to be amazing and it's going to top any feeling that we, can, we, we have right now. Because we're going to be in the presence of God. Uh, so it's going to be fantastic. Um, and we also learned that everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what background you have, what religion, what culture, uh, what job you have, everyone has somebody on the throne in their life. And that could be, it could be money, it could be pleasure, it could be celebrity, or better, it, it could be the, the living God, and that's who, who it ought to be, because no one else can, can take that, that throne, uh, or rather no one else has the right to take that throne. Um, but we bondage ourselves under things, we create idols of things, and really we should worship God and God alone. Um, and then we reflected on God's goodness and his faithfulness to us, and what it really means to worship God. Uh, if you remember the elders put their crowns before God, and Romans 12, 1 tells us that true spiritual worship is that our bodies are a living sacrifice. It's to accredit worthiness to God, it's to give God our whole uh, selves, to give him everything that he is due, and he is due everything. Um, but today is, is more technical, really, because I wanted to sort of at least show my opinion of who I believe these elders are, uh, and then there's some mysterious creatures uh, as well that we read about. So I wanted to just um, sort of cover the technical, the tricky part of, of this chapter, and then I wanted to just take a look at an example of, um, of somebody in the Bible who, who really offered himself as a living sacrifice. 
So starting with verse 4 today, and it says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And we, we were introduced to, to, to this group of 24 elders, and who are they? What are they? What does it mean for us? Does it mean anything <coughs> for us? Now, there tends to be, no one actually knows the answer. The Bible doesn't explicitly tell us who these elders are, so it's theories. Um, we've got, I think there's one theory better than the other theory, but it is still a bit of a, you know, an estimated guess, really. It doesn't explicitly tell us. So, this is my opinion. Now, I've got a good argument for my opinion, but it's my opinion nevertheless, and you can take it or, or leave it. Uh, but, but I think it's a good <coughs> opinion, otherwise I wouldn't be sharing it, would I? Um, but the scholars tend to be divided on two main theories of who these elders are. The first one being that they're angelic beings, and the second one that they are the raptured church. Now, you can probably guess which, which I, I think they are. Um, so, so for me, I, I find that, that second theory, that they're the raptured church, more convincing. Um, but regardless of which sort of perspective you take with this, and regardless of which the actual answer is, it doesn't actually change too much for <coughs> us on what we've been learning so far. Um, now, we've been learning that we're going to be, uh, the church won't go through the tribulation, that it'll be raptured up. Now, if the elders are angelic, that doesn't change. But if they're the raptured church, well, the other uh, idea that the church goes through the rapture, that can't be true then, can it? Because they're, um, you know, we're in the presence of God, uh, casting the thrones down. But for us, there's no negative impact, whether we're right or wrong on this. Uh, it either changes nothing, or it just reinforces what we've already been taught. I've got a few Bibles at home, some Bibles better than others actually. Um, I'm probably thinking of probably six or seven different kinds of Bibles in our house, and I've got my favourites. Uh, one of them is um, called the Recovery Version, and it's published by Living Stream Ministry. This one, it's, it's only a New Testament, and I got it free. Um, I, I was on Bible Gateway, and they just said, Receive this Bible, got to go on then. So I, uh, I, I signed up for it, and it came. Um, and it's, it's very, very interesting. The, there are different kinds of Bible translations. You either have word for word or phrase for phrase in the way they're translated. The NIV Bible is a very good Bible, but that is phrase for phrase. It's more dynamic. Um, the, the, the translators looked at what's this sentence trying to say? And they would give the meaning of what the sentence is trying to say. Then you have versions, good versions, very good versions, King James Version, ESV Version, NASV, they're word for word. What's the literal meaning of this word? Um, sometimes with the word for word it can be a bit heavier, a bit harder to read, because when you're translating words from one language to another, it, it doesn't always read smoothly. Uh, but the phrase for phrase, sometimes the words can lose the power of what they're actually intended to be. So it's good to read a few different ones. Um, this Living Stream Ministry publication, Recovery Version, is as far as you can go on the word-for-word -word, uh, um, version. So each word is supposed to be the exact meaning from the Greek, but sometimes the sentences can be a little bit funny. And because of that, this Bible has a very in-depth commentary. Uh, so much so that there's more commentary than Bible in this one, which is a little bit worrying because then you start to read man's opinions and man's thoughts rather than actual scripture. But it's interesting. Um, now this uh, version of the Bible uh, argues that um, the elders are angels. And it says, before the Lord's second coming, they're sitting on thrones already. But this is an example of a commentary that doesn't give you much more than that. And so I think, well, why, where, where's its evidence for that? It's just saying they're angels because they sat on these thrones. And then it goes on to say some other arguments that the elders are angelic beings because they're, the elders are always grouped with angels and the angels can sing. We learn that in chapter 5. But that's about as far as the arguments go. And I don't think that's 
very persuasive, actually. Um, because for, for, one, um, for one thing, well, just because they're singing, I mean, we can sing, don't we? And in, in, in chapter 5, there's an interesting song there talking about being of redemption and we're redeemed. Um, and then I never see anywhere in Scripture where angels are sat on thrones. And these elders are on thrones and were going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. Um, so I'm not too convinced by that. And one important principle of studying the Bible is to always allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. The Bible is its best commentary on the Bible. Um, to give you an example of this, and I, and I showed this example years ago when I had spoken Bible contradictions, but it's a good example. In Revelation 12:1. Uh, it says, And the great woman appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Well, if you take that as a literal woman with the moon under her feet, um, it, it becomes very, very difficult to, to sort of comprehend the, the sheer size for a star of this woman, and uh, exactly where she comes from and who she is, but actually, if you allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, we read about the same imagery in Genesis 37. And if you remember, um, the, the, in Genesis 37, it re referred to Israel. It had the 12 stars with the 12 tribes of Israel. You had uh, the sun and the moon, and, and, and there you've got, got Jacob and, and, and um, Joseph Mumba. Um, now, the word elder, Translated from the Greek term presbyterios, which is where we get Presbyterian church from, um, wherever that word is previously used in scripture, it always refers to a man, never to an angel. So why would it suddenly refer to an angel in Revelation chapter 4 when throughout the rest of the Bible it never has done before? When we allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, we see that angel, uh, that elder, always refers to humans. Um, interestingly as well, the elders described are wearing white garments. And if you cast your mind back just a couple of weeks uh, to Revelation 3, 5, and that was the church of Sardis, it says, the one who conquers... Um, and that, that's, that's the believer in Christ, the person who has accepted Christ into their life, and they conquer it through Christ, but will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So who's wearing the white garments there? It's not the angels, it's the one who conquers. So there, I think we have an evidence that these elders aren't angelic beings, but the raptured church, when we're raptured up, we're conquered and we've put, clothed ourselves with these white garments which Christ has, has uh, uh, promised to us. In Revelation 2.10, going further back to these um, letters to the churches, this one to Smyrna, and now you can see how important it is to read these letters before or jumping into stuff which is a bit more exciting, like the rapture and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the tribulation and things like that. Um, the, these letters give us a lot of background knowledge. Well, it says, Do not fear, um, am I on the right verse here? Let me check. Uh, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And we see that these uh, Christians, faithful unto death, and if you remember at the rapture, the dead will rise first. Then uh, we will be caught up in the earth. Well, they're given a crown. And what do the elders have? They all have crowns. They were in crowns. And I don't see anywhere in Scripture where angels are wearing crowns. So the more we look at it, it seems to me that all the evidence is seeming to point that these elders of a raptured church. Again, Revelation 5.11. 
which we, we've not got up to yet um, in our studies. But that says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands. Well, there it's interesting because there's a distinction. It says, um, around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels. So, around the, those living creatures and around the, uh, uh, the elders, we can hear the voices of the angels. Now, if the elders were the angels, why would it distinguish between the two? Why would both be mentioned there? Uh, so, I think that is a... Uh, it is, is interesting. Um, and I think this should be very, very exciting because if these elders of a raptured church were not going through the tribulation, it's another, another promise from Scripture that we're not going through the tribulation. And sometimes people criticise us of, of, of wanting to escape, you know, you're just wanting to run away from the troubles. Well, not necessarily, we're, we're just wanting to be faithful to what the Word says and praise God when he doesn't want us to go through it. You know, I mean, why would we want to go through it? I mean, who would want to go through that? It's going to be awful. Um, now, I don't know how strong this argument is, um, but in biblical numerology, I, I, from what I've been reading, the number 24 represents priesthood. I don't know if that's actually true, because I've not sort of found it. You know, too many references to 24 being priesthood. There are a few, but if 24 sort of represented it, I would expect it to be very obvious all the time. Like the number seven is, 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 is a godly number of completion, isn't it? Perfection. Uh, and, and that's something that is full. And we have that throughout Scripture so blatantly obvious to us. But if the number 24 does uh, represent a priesthood, well, it's also interesting that uh, there are 24 elders, and when we turn to 1 Peter 2, 4, and I always find Peter's quite a, quite a hard book to find. You, you've got to go past Hebrews, past James. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4. <coughs> and... Um, in fact, if I just start at the greeting, in, uh, right at the start of chapter 1, and we see who Peter's talking to, to keep this in context, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, I might be saying that wrong, Asia, definitely saying this next one wrong, uh, Bithynia, right, couldn't say it be pronounced anyway, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, in other words, Christians. Peter's writing to Christians, people who are, are, are to be sanctified um, of the Spirit to, in obedience to Jesus. Well, 1 Peter 2, 4 says, As you come to him, Hang on, am I on the right one? 1 Peter 2 4. 2 5, sorry, 2 5 it is. Uh, we'll start at 4 though. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. In verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sac sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I, I just had this thought last night, could Peter be actually, could there be, I'm not saying there is, but could there be a link between us as Christians being called to be a royal priesthood and then 24 representing the priesthood and there being 24 elders? In other words, could it be saying that we're called to be raptured up and to be there before uh, Jesus uh, as the raptured church? I'm not saying that link is there, but it's interesting. Um, and I, I just had that thought last night. 
Um, so, and, and finally, my final argument here is only the church is promised to sit upon thrones. And we see that in, back in Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, 21, the church of Laodicea, and he says, the one who conquers, so the Christian, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I don't see angels being promised anywhere to sit on thrones, but we are. When we're uh, Christians, are promised to rule and reign with, with Jesus, to, to sit on thrones with him. So to me, it seems like these elders have to be the raptured church, which is fantastic because uh, we're, we're not going through any tribulation as some people want, want to make you believe because we're there. We're, we'll be at the throne with, with Christ. Um, some people have suggested it could be Israel as well. You've got the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got 12 apostles in the church. 12 and 12 is 24. Um, but I don't really buy into that because from my understanding of scripture, Israel's judgments and rewards come after the tribulation when Jesus goes on the Mount of Olives and he separates the sheep from the goats. So I don't think Israel will be having their rewards at that time, but that comes later, at least in, in my understanding. Uh, so I, I don't think it applies to Israel as well. I think it's just the church, which, um, well, praise God, we're, we're in the church. Verses 5 and 6, so chapter 4, 5 and 6. And I better read this right uh, this week. Last week I said pearls of thunder, uh, but it's, it's peals of thunder it, it should be. So 5 and 6, from, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And round the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. So we have some fascinating creatures there. Um, and I, I was trying to think if there was any sort of um, meaning to this uh, sea of glass and, and the lightning and the rumblings and, and to be honest with you I'm not 100% sure um, we see in Exodus 19 uh, verse 16 we see thunder and lightning displayed the power and the holiness of God um, at, when he was uh, on the Mount Sinai um, and, and we see here the, the, the flashes of, of lightning, these peals of thunder, we see that again, showing the holiness and the majesty and the power of God. Um, but regarding this sea of glass like crystal, um, you'll have to ask Kevin after, I, I'm, I'm no clue. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, one idea I read was some suggest it may poetically symbolize the floor of heaven, heaven and the ceiling of the universe acting as a, and I quote, a transparent tranquility contrasted against earthly turmoil. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't really know what the sea of glass is, is about, to be honest. That's something uh, I need to try and find out because I don't know it yet. Um, but let's come back to these uh, creatures full of eyes. Um, and I always thought it would be interesting um, so to just show, speaking out loud here, is it on the nativity scene, and you know how the children dress up as angels. Um, I'd love to know how a teacher would react if uh, maybe one day I sent my child to the nativity and she was just full of eyes. <laughs> what the uh, teacher would react to that. I think that would be uh, interesting. Uh, because angels aren't wearing little white dresses with furry wings on their back. They're, they're not like that, are they? Um, but anyway, Verses 7 and 8, around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion, 
the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings full of eyes, all around and within, by day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy. Not the three holies, we've got a triune God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And uh, just on that note, with them being full of eyes, that must be important because it's repeated three times. So there's an emphasis there. Um, why are they full of eyes? I don't know. Um, I wonder whether it's because, you know, an eye is what we see through, so, you know, it shows light, it shows vision, uh, tra uh, clarity of, of, of sight and seeing things properly. Uh, so I wonder whether it might be to show that they can truly see because they're in uh, the presence of Christ and they're not blinded by sin. But that's an idea. I don't know. And I don't know if anybody knows why they're full of eyes. Maybe God just wanted them to be that way. And, you know, he's got his own reasons. Um, but why do they look the way they do? Now, some have suggested that the lion represents all the beasts, the calf represents the cattle, man obviously mankind, eagle the birds, and thus all living creatures being represented with the exception of creeping things and those that live in water. And that could be interesting because, well, there's no sea in heaven, so there's no need for the, the, the fish. Uh, so there's no need for them to be represented there. And um, if creeping things is sort of headed up perhaps by a serpent, well, there's no demonic presence in heaven, so, so it, the exclusion of the creeping things could be to show that there's no evil presence there. That's one theory. Again, it's just theories this morning. Um, the, the other idea um, could be uh, that the, 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 the lion represents Christ's kingship, his majesty, his, his courage, his bravery, his power. The ox represents his hard work in his sacrificial nature. Mankind, because Christ was fully man, and the eagle showing Christ's justice. That's another theory. Uh, but again, these are just, it's, it's just a bit of guesswork, really. We don't actually know why. Um, but interestingly, and this, this is something which I thought was very interesting, um, you don't need to turn to it, but Leviticus 11 tells us that the lion and the eagle were unclean animals. Um, it, it gives a description of clean animals and, and uh, unclean. Uh, the lion would, would be unclean. The eagle would be unclean. But we read in Acts, don't we, that Christ has made all things clean. And I thought that was well, that is quite interesting. Um, in this new heaven and the new earth which is going to happen, um, there's, there's no need for dirty animals as such. Christ has made all things clean. All creation has been redeemed. Um, also, the calf and the man, maybe not man, but, but, but the calf and the man are would be a more gentle, compassionate, curving creature, whereas an, a lion and an eagle is more wild and, and ferocious and savage. But in Isaiah uh, 11, uh, 6 to 9, we read that the, they're going to dwell side by side. You know, the, 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 the lion and the... I have to turn to it, actually, because I can't remember the wording, but they're going to eat together. They're going to... Mm -hmm. The lion and the, the, the lamb, they're going to they're gonna be together, but they're not going to fear each other. Um, the child, I've just had another thought actually, it said, doesn't it, the child will be able to play by the adder's nest. Um, so that sort of destroys my, uh, the, uh, the serpent theory being excluded, doesn't it? Because the adder's a snake. So, um, but, but yeah, lots of theories here. We don't actually know why the creatures look the way they do, but we can just make suggestions. We don't know. Um, the creatures sing, Holy, holy, holy God, who was and is to come. And I think it, it's important just to, to remember that they never cease to say that. God is infinitely holy. He's 
infinitely majestic, <coughs> he's infinitely powerful, and no matter how many times I say it, it'll never be enough, because his, his holiness, it, it doesn't stop, there's no limit to it, and they're always going to be singing, holy, holy, holy. And just imagine that again, when we're in the presence of God, and we're going to hear this, holy, holy, holy. And I'm sure sometimes you might have been at a conference, or you might have been uh, visiting a, a church much bigger than this, and there's been hundreds of people all singing at the same time. It's quite amazing, isn't it? But just imagine what it's going to be like when we hear these singing, holy, 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 over and over again. It will be phenomenal. Um, Verses 9 to 11 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, I believe that's us, fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our, God, our Lord and God to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And we, we learnt last week that to cast our crowns before the Lord, to worship, is to accredit God with righteousness, with worthiness, with all the honour he is due and, and, and deserves. Um, and we also uh, remember that Romans 12, 1, tells us that spiritual worship is offering our body as a living sacrifice. Um, and today we have a huge challenge in doing that. The situation in Afghanistan, the refugees arriving, um, is, is a threat and an opportunity. It's a threat because we're going to have more Muslims come in and history has told us that means there's going to be more pre pressure to sort of conform to the way of being, not to offend, you know, more halal food in the shops. Um, maybe, I, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised in the future if Sunday is a work day and Friday, mosque day is, is the weekend day. The way it's going, who knows? Um, so so there's the, the threat there, but there's the opportunity that a lot of these Muslims have never held a Bible before, have never held the, heard the Gospel, and they come into a country now where there's freedom, the church is still open today, we can still access the Bible, we can still talk to them, they've got the chance to hear the Gospel and to meet uh, with, with Christ. Um, we've got the challenge of the LGBT groups and the, the BLM groups. Um, last night, Sarah and I watched a, a documentary, I think it was called Paint the Wall Black, it's free on YouTube, you should watch it. Um, I tell you what, after you've watched that, you will never read in the same way where, when Jesus left the crowds. You know, when the crowds were stirring up and, and they were wanting to kill him and, and he sort of slipped away. You, that'll give you a new sort of take on that verse. Um, so we've got, the, in this documentary, there was a small business owner he owned a deli, and he, he refused to, to bow the knee, as it were. He refused to acknowledge Black Lives Matters. He said all lives matters. All people are created in the image of God. All people should be treated with dignity and with, with respect because we're made in the image of God. And he, and, and he said at one point, I don't care whether, whether a white person, a black person, a Hispanic person owns the shop. If a cop is good, it's good. You know, and he's going to go. It doesn't matter what the, the colour is. But he was made faced with tremendous spiritual attack, protest, vile, hateful comments. His shop was forced to close, it was vandalised. Um, he, he was driven out of town in the end. His family were threatened. Uh, his family lost the jobs through association. Um, it was terrible. So we've, we've got the cultural Marxist threat as well. Um, but even when there is opportunity, if we are prepared to allow Sorry, even when there is opposition, there is opportunity. And if we're prepared to allow ourselves to be this living sacrifice, um, then we, we, we're, we're going to make a difference. We're going to see people come to know Christ. We're, we're going to, uh, to, to see um, lives changed and hearts turned around. And I just want to very, very briefly, I'm not going to labour this, um, but I just want to, to briefly give you um, three observations, um, and this is something that I've, I've picked up from Wilberforce as well, um, about the Apostle Paul. 
Um, and three things we note when he gave his defense in Jerusalem in Acts chapter what, chapters 21 and 22. And I'm not going to read them, but it's, if you want future reference for later, it's Acts 21 and 22. And the first observation is Paul had a reason to give a defense. He, because he was, you know, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we should look at what was Paul like. And he, he, he truly gave himself, he was truly worshipping, he gave himself as this living sacrifice. Because of that, he had a reason to give a defense. In this documentary, this business owner had a reason to give a defense. He was facing persecution, he was facing slander, misinformation. He was driven out of town. He, you know, he's got a reason to give this defense of himself. Um, there was a cost to associating with this small business owner. There was a cost to associating with Paul. And he said, I'm thankful in 2 Timothy 1.16 to those people who are not ashamed of my chains. And we mustn't be ashamed of the gospel. And we mustn't be ashamed of the, of the cross of Christ. It is an offence to this country. It's an offence to people because they don't want to change their lives. But we mustn't be ashamed of it. Um, we must stand for truth. We must support and encourage other people who do. Um, we should also not be surprised, therefore, if the world starts to hate us because what we stand for. It hated Paul, it hated this small business owner, it hated Christ. You know, and if we are starting to get hated, it's probably a sign we're doing something right. You know, we're, we're being an ambassador for Christ. So don't be uh, surprised and don't be discouraged if, if the world starts to, to hate you. Uh, secondly, Paul was eager to give a defence. Now, Paul, he, he, some people will say, you, you shouldn't need to give a defence. Look at Jesus, when he was on trial, he didn't say anything. But it's not the best argument, because Jesus came with the intention of dying. You know, I'm sure he could have found the words to give himself a defence, but then he wouldn't have been executed, would he? So he came with the purpose of dying. Now, Paul had the motto, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That if he was to die, it's gain, it's going to be with Christ. But it wasn't his intention to die. His intention to live is Christ. So as long as I'm alive, I can tell people about Christ. And we can learn from him, though, that he was to take advantage of his rights and his law. When dealing with the Romans, he claimed his rights as a Roman citizen, and that gave him special privileges and special uh, um, exemptions. For example, he couldn't be crucified because he was a Roman. Um, similarly, when dealing with the Jews, he claimed his Jewish credentials. So he would have used the law to protect him and to help him. But also, he was keen to show that his message, it, it was, it was consistent. He hadn't broken any laws, and he didn't deserve the treatment he was receiving. Um, when Sarah posted her comments uh, back in 2019, she didn't break the law. She didn't deserve the treatment uh, that she had. Um, but actually, when you, therefore, you're saying, I've not broken the law, so I can fight this, and I can challenge this, that gives you a platform to share the gospel. That gives you a platform to, uh, to, to, to preach. Um, and if you think of Andrea Williams, who we're looking forward to welcoming next month, she uses the law as a platform. Um, her clients haven't broken the law, otherwise they wouldn't take them on. They take people who have been mistreated, who are uh, standing for the truth, but they, they've been slandered and they've been treated wrongly. And she's using the law to get them an audience with people and for her to have an audience with people. And although she's protecting them and she's helping them, this, all these legal cases have allowed her and other people to preach the gospel to judges, to, to tell journalists about Christ, to, to get the gospel across to politicians and everybody watching on the news um, on where, when they've had the opportunity to go onto TV. So sometimes defending the faith can also mean defending your rights 
And when you defend your rights, you have the opportunity to speak about he who is righteous. So you, you have that opportunity. And thirdly, and just to, to finish, Paul preached Christ. Time and after time, when he was put on trial, he found a way to give his testimony and to talk about the resurrection um, of Christ, about faith, about repentance, about the person of Christ. And he believed that to live is Christ, to die is gain. He would not submit himself to slander, he would not uh, surrender any of his rights, but he would use these as a tool to preach the gospel. So, as Christians, like these 24 elders, when we stand before Christ, we will cast our crowns before him, we will accredit to Christ his worthiness, we'll give him everything we have, but until that day, we should give him everything we have now, and that is our very selves, and in that way, in that uh, idea, we should be living sacrifices, preaching Christ, cultivating our land with the gospel wherever we can.